I do like to hug. And I hug everywhere I go, and I get hugged everywhere I go. And I just freaking love that hug, man, don't you? It's my kind of drug, I tell you. Yes, indeed. It's kind of unique. You'd be walking down the street, and people just come out of nowhere. Give you a big old hug. Isn't that awesome? And you pass it on, baby. You meet somebody, the vibe's just right, you give a big old hug, you know? It's all right, man, see? We do more of that, baby, it's hold me tight. And let people know we're there to help them feel right. I mean, just fold right into it. Ain't none of this A-frame shit. Just fold right into it. Be there heart to heart, soul to soul. Be conscious. Be alive. Be aware. Be awake. Be in love. Yeah. Not falling in love. Not going for the joke. No, be in love. That state of conscious awareness where you're present in all life and happier than hell about it, man. That's the moment you're looking for. And that's where this hug does lead, man. And that's part of how we create this great big old uh, loving in this world, babies. So says Grandpa Coyote here on the Coyote Medicine Show. Only on the Hazy Radio Network, baby. Helping you get it right as we take flight here. Yes, indeed. We'll get it right one way or the other. Yeah. Rolling into that little story here about the old Kim Cafe. And what a hug can do for you now. Out here, even if you're in the center of the universe, you know, the center of conscious, aware presence of being and persons and, you know, all the things that comes naturally to those who are awake and alive and trying to get themselves back in over freaking drive. You know? <laughs> okay. So let's kind of put it this way, you know. These folks in this room here, you know, this little Kim Cafe, this is April 20, 2008, southeastern Colorado, desolate little town of Kim, Colorado, desolate little cafe of the Kim Cafe, you know, the center of the town, the center of the universe. And as it turns out, the center of everyone's heart there, man, it was quite an amazing experience as we're standing there sitting there sipping our coffee and this glow comes into the room and all of a sudden there's everybody's just full of light and there's all these interesting connections and reminiscences going on and just wow a whole lot of coming together too you know in this energetic sort of way with the light the love we could feel it you know it's like our heart is unified there in the center of the room you know and then i'm distracted you know unconsciously to or consciously actually towards this lady sitting over this mysterious lady sitting over by the window and she is very mysterious until now and we've been unraveling through our little connection together that we're beginning to experience a glow between us kind of a silvery glow it's kind of a clear one it's like you know somebody uh, held up a uh, crystal to the sunlight and we're refracting something here man we're we're experiencing an old unity an old place some old times some ancient connections our heart know one another like crazy though different in this world we may be and way way far apart socially and economically and everything else you want to say and see it's all kind of divided between us we just you know we're the kind of would look at each other and say no and just walk away <laughs> i mean i could admire her for being her and she could admire me for being me i reckon but whatever you know she might roll her eyes and say oh god the poor loser <laughs> something like that bound to go on uncertain man you know because we're just not the type that would, you know. See, so it's really interesting that, you know, we would have a connection, you know, that we would uh, all of a sudden be developing something in a conscious way that, oh, wow, I never would have dreamed possible before. Now, I've made some real inter interesting connections in my time, you know, with these parties i can only call snowed in parties because that's what they are they always happen in some little truck stop or usually it's a little hotel of one sort or another one of my favorite stories is the one about the girls basketball team there 
when I was snowed in in York, Nebraska at the old Ramada Inn there. I think it's changed hands now. I don't even know if it's still there, you know. York's kind of grown up a little bit, too, around it, you know. But anyway, back then, it's 70s, man, sometime. I knew there was a storm coming, and I thought, well, shit, I cheat a little bit, you know. I don't want to get snowed in out there in Big Spring and have to listen to that farmer and them kid, his kid argue over who's right and who's wrong about growing pot. I mean, shoot. Nature says grow pot. It's obvious the kid's correct and the old man's full of you-know-what. And I've been through that scenario a few times already. And that's, you know, where I'm going to be if I get naturally snowed in, according to what I'm hearing on the weather reports, on the radio anyway. So it sounds like a good day to take a little time off. And, you know, uh, I really love that little Ramada Inn there in York, Nebraska. I've been stayed there a few times and had some nice little parties. They have a lively little bar there. A lot of the locals come there and there's some good music, you know. So it's kind of a fun little uh, break when you have the time to do it. Take a little break there at the Ramada Inn in York and just kick back and party for a night, man. You know, have some fun. Well, son of a gun, you know, and I see this it's a big ass storm coming. I mean the reports are all saying ugly, 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 you know, and I'm thinking this is where I'd rather be snowed in. You know, so I stopped there about three o'clock in the afternoon when it was still bright and sunny out. And I just prayed this weather would hit. <laughs> oh, I think it was like six thirty, seven o'clock. Finally it blew in and man, it was nasty, you know. Cars were sliding every which way out there. The billion people in the ditch, you know, it was a mess. Typical blizzard, you know, uh, in in um, central Nebraska there. Just crazy stuff, man. It can get really wild, deep, and wooly. Just like it's doing here at the King Cafe in 2008, man. Goodness gracious, it's piled up over the roof. Now that stuff is blowing in, man, I'm telling you. Well, this wasn't quite that bad. This one only had three, four, five-foot drifts. It wasn't, you know, tremendously terrible. But it was terrible enough to stop all the traffic on Interstate 80 once again, of course. So long about, you know, I got a fairly good party going. I met this chicken holler from Arkansas, and we were working on livening the place up a little bit, he and I, and, you know, there was some dancing going on, and there was a few people there, and there's one intriguing young lady from western Nebraska that was there with her grandparents, just disappeared off into the darkness after giving me a look that said, baby, I wish I could. <laughs> Oh, man, I tell you. So we was off to a flying start for the night, you know. And then this bus pulls up out there in the storm, escorted by the highway patrol somehow. They towed him off or something. But they got him off the highway and brought him to the Ramada Inn. And the door opens and off pumps this, uh, oh, kind of prim, skinny looking, maybe five foot two, blondie, short blonde hair, kind of fierce looking woman. No skinny thing, though. And behind her comes about 17 of the most beautiful and tall and gracious chicks you'd ever want to run into, man. It was the girls' basketball team from the Fremont College in Fremont, Nebraska. Holy cow. I hope they won their game, man. You know, the other team should have just fainted out of respect, you know. <laughs> So we wound up having a fairly decent party. There was a lively little band in there, one of them traveling bands, you know, that tours all over the Midwest and does a lot of these hotels. And these guys were just, and they were young, and these guys were really rocking, you know. And after a while, we had to get old Miss Foofy, that skinny little blonde chick who turned out to be the coach in the chaperono. We had to get her out of the way of my little chicken, and you'd never believe it. This guy is like 52 years old and bald-headed and kind of bulldoggy looking dude, you know. And maybe, you know, just a couple inches taller than me, about 5'9", and fairly muscular, but a little portly, you know. <laughs> Truck drivers, most of them have a belly, and I'm one of the few that don't, you know. <laughs> well, somehow that guy, this chicken hauler from... You know, he told me he's going to do it, too, in advance. We were talking there at the bar, and he says, don't you worry about that coach. He says, I'll take care of her. And I looked at him, and I says, how? <laughs> and said, it's just not possible, man, you know. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he grinned. And he says, you watch. And I did. And I was amazed. The guy charmed her. 
He really did. And for too long, they disappeared off into the woodwork somewhere. And the girls and I were free to party, man. And boy, we had coalesced that. We, we got the band out in the lobby that night. We were, you know, we were, I'm sure, violating some local liquor laws and shit. But we were partying, you know, they, they, all those old Ramada inns had those curved stairways up from the lobby to the second deck, you know, and then a balcony up there. We were partying all up and down those, I mean, this, all up and down those stairs and, you know, dancing on the hotel desk and just, I mean, all over the place. We were drunk and crazy and just cutting it loose because we knew we were going to be there for at least, you know, 24 hours or more, you know. And, you know, of course I wound up giving up my room that night and let some other people take it that really needed it, you know. And I just, you know, partied, 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 you know. When I finally crashed, I, I don't remember where, but <laughs> it was pretty nice. One of those times, man. So the snow winds can be, you know, and through the years, man, I've been through a billion snow wind parties, man. Well, I say a billion, that's a great exaggeration, but... I would say somewhere a thousand or two anyway, you know, the times that I've been snowed in or, you know, some of the finest times waiting at the snow in was uh, over there in uh, Boomtown there, Verdi, Nevada, man, you know, a lot of times. I'd spent days sitting there waiting for them to open up the Donner Pass up there to where I could get through, you know. I, I remember I told you now earlier about my little boat hauling truck, how it was really tricky to hang chains on that thing, so it's something we really avoided, you know. So I would sit there and play blackjack, you know, in the in the casino at Boomtown there in Verdi for hours on end until, you know, they declared the hill open again and away I'd go, get up over the mountain before they closed it back down again and I had to hang the chains, you know. So I've been a lot. I got to know all the ladies that dealt there, mostly lady dealers there, and uh, all of their children and all of their names, and you know uh, who had the chicken pox and who had the moms. <laughs> and I'd just sit there and play for a dollar a hand. I never lose, man. You know, I'd start stacking the money up. Shit, she'd take it so quick, make my head spin. You know, so that was kind of my routine there. Once in a while, I really would make a little money, but mostly I'd just sit there. And if if I thought the pass was going to open, I'd be drinking coffee. If I thought otherwise. As well, there'd be some intoxicant intelligence in my hands there. You know, I don't know how intelligent that intoxicant was, but it seemed to serve me. <laughs> oh, hell, and I'd flat fall in love two or three times each time I got snowed in there. Of course, these, these traveling ladies, man. And, oh, wow, I tell you, just, you know, there's some real sweet moments to be had in the journey in life. I mean, really sweet moments. And I'm not talking about you know, necessarily, you know, the big fling. I, you know, sometimes just a simple little hug. Kind of like what me and that queen of darkness, as I've called her before earlier in this work, you bet. And and I are embracing. We're, we're hugging. They're, you know, right alongside the fireplace. Something drew us together. I mean, this this memory of the ancient connection, you know. And there's my old heart and her old heart. And oh my God, the groan. The groan of the ages, you know. The stuff we started back then. Flowing through life. Oh, the groan. It's so deep. It comes from somewhere way down below your crotch, man. Oh, man. Maybe it's in the earth and it just comes through you. And you go, oh, God. You almost die and you come back to life and you realize it's all right now. You feel the heaviness in one another's heart, pure and simple, deep, broad, expansive heaviness. But somehow you've laughed your way through it. And she's been kind of swept along in a different sort of way, but in her own way, in her arrogant way, laughing her way through it too. We can see this about one another. I mean, in that moment, we know almost everything about each other. We ain't prying either. It's just happening. And then the moment passes, just like good hugs do. And we break apart and look at one another. The eyes, the look doesn't break. It's consciousness. There's some awareness. And then she raises her eyebrows. And I kind of chuckle and she kind of giggles. 
And we take our respective seat there. Alongside each other now, you know, might as well be a little closer because, you know, the old man is a little hard to hear and all that earwax buildies. We'll be back here in just a minute with the rest of this story, the rest of this tale, at least this segment of it, as we continue at the Kim Cafe in Kim, Colorado, April 20, 2008. Now, I'm going to make sure Oki uh, gets his uh, tonsils taken care of here, gets outside where he can fully express himself in a cohesive manner, in harmony with the rest of the universe. Okay, babies, we'll be back here in just a wee bit. Oh, we love you, babies. <laughs> Oh, babies, I've been to Oklahoma. I've been to Arizona and New Mexico, too. How about that? How about you? <laughs> You've been around, too. Oh, babies, I, I, yeah, I like that song with old Johnny Cash, the Oklahoma, Tatcha Hatch, Patchy Patch. I've been everywhere, man. Don't you? Oh, that's just, you know, that's my theme song, man. Seems like I was born with travel and feet, you know. I just couldn't hardly sit still. I mean, I loved where I was born, Dad, as a beautiful and bodacious place you could go up in the mountains and experience angels and all kinds of beautiful things man beautiful ways you could just let yourself relax when you were there amongst the mountains the trees the birds the animals the rocks the spring you know there's little springs here and there oh man i tell you there's like Wow, I mean, I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time up there because I was, you know, in forced labor from the age of five onward working on daddy's farm and ranches and stuff and just had to take care of business. But I was allowed some free time. I did get some. And I did get to roam around those mountains a bunch, you know. So I really loved that. The culture I was born into, well, I kind of felt frozen out of. Really, I just didn't feel like it was there for me, you know. I tried. I really did. But I just couldn't be that, what they wanted me to be. Of course not. Who could be, you know. You have to set yourself free. you got to be who you are, you know. It takes a while to figure out what that is and how to do it, you know, especially in this world. Because, boy, you know, like me, you're born with a formula right over your head, man, and that's the life you're going to live. Like, no, I don't think so, man. Let's make some adjustments here, <laughs> however slightly, huh? <laughs> you got to go your own way, don't you know, <laughs> don't you say. Amen and glory, hallelujah. So let's get back to the Kim Cafe there in Kim, Colorado, April 20, 2008, later in the evening. You know, the, the the queen of darkness, as I've taken to the calling her. Now, I say that with my tongue in my cheek now, because I know better. But yet again, when she first came in that place, that's the feeling we all had, the queen of darkness, the ruler of pain. You know, and here we are. You know, good old good dude and the queen of darkness just backing up from an embrace that was incredible. One of the better ones I've felt in a long, long time. I get a lot of hugs when I'm out roaming around like that, you know. I couldn't believe it, man. I mean, the connection was divine, obviously, but something more just mystifying. Each of us are looking at one another now. We haven't broken the gates. We felt the groan of the ages, you know. We felt our experience back in the beginnings of times. We saw it roll through us. We felt the heartache when it began. And we have felt the heartache through the whole of the ages and rolled it right through to the time and now. And we understood why she was the queen of darkness. And why I had borne so much pain myself in this old freaking reality, man. I've carried a load since I was a little kid, man. They really, uh, they really tried to ensure that I would follow the formula. <laughs> it didn't work. But boy, it did load me down, baby. It did load me down. Slow me down a little bit, but not a whole lot. Salute, babies. Oh, that's some good coffee. That's the sweetest coffee. The most sensual cup. The most sensual coffee mug, I should say. Ever to be unleashed upon humanity. You know, get your official Coyote Club mug today. <laughs> <laughs> Do I sound like a damn commercial or what, man? Shit. Guys, we're free falling now, baby. It was that woman's fault, the queen of the dark. I mean, how, who would, ah, uh-uh, uh-uh, not ever. But there we were, 
you know, in a moment in time that's just spectacular in what it revealed to us. You know, I felt a peace there between us. I felt a relief from the agony of the ages and all the torment we created because along with the torment we saw also the fires that we had started back then that virtually assured that we would come back home to our heart. Yeah, we were going to go through one long old piece of shit of a nightmare and have to live through a lot of craziness. But we were going to come out of it alive and more conscious and more present than ever before. The reward was worthy of the experience in the dream. And we saw this. We knew this. We released ourselves and let it go. Let it go back into the muck of time. Clear back to the mud from whence we came before we arose from the ocean. Clear back to the beginning of whatever was a beginning of whatever was a beginning of whatever was a beginning. Undid it all, man. And I still feel that undoing right to this moment. We began something there. That little embrace and that little moment in time, that little moment of complete aware communication. I wouldn't quite call it a grok. I would call it, well, something close to that. A level of understanding was achieved. An understanding of one another's path through time. Now, you don't get this too often in this world, <laughs> to say the least. And there it was. We could see it just like threads in a tapestry weaving its way through time, right back to the beginnings of time. And we could see our two characters there. And, of course, there were others. It wasn't just she and I. We're not like Atom and Eva, as the case may be. Yet we got that energy. We are Adam and Eve, you know. It's just that there's more than one of us. There's several. <laughs> kind of how it repeats itself all the way throughout humanity. There's these numbers that keep repeating themselves. And when they do, you got to look there. Because, I mean, the numbers of people influencing the reality. you got to look there and see who's there. Because it's going to be the same old crew. It's one thing I saw right there in that moment in time. It's going to be the same old crew throughout time that are living this life and, and uh, you know, fanning the fires of love and keeping them aflame and glowing so that humanity can get through all the darkness and all the pain. You see, it's always been the same crew. Always is. I'm speaking in it from a soul presence level. The, the angelic characters that we are, that caricature, as we say, in, in the universal way, because really all of the characters that we play are caricatures. They're, we're kind of making fun of ourselves with each and every one of them, including this human one. There's a lot of coyote medicine. I'll go on to explain that a little later, but there's a lot of coyote medicine here, you know, in our, even in our forms and, and in the world around us. I mean, there, there, there is a sense of humor here like you wouldn't believe, baby. Well, you're starting to believe because you've seen it. A lot of us are starting to live it now. Thank goodness. That's what frees us up. That's what sets us free. That's what helps us be who and what we are. Finally. Yeah, baby. Just be free. Let it be. Let it come. Let it glow. Let it be. Yeah, feel that heart. Feel that growing nature in there. Oh, darling. That's the fire we fan all the way through time. She and I as characters in a divine play called Time. And the several others there with us. Adams, A-T-O-M-S. Yeah, little Adams and little Eve us for lack of better terminology. Or let's say Adam S. Yet individually characteristic be separated already. In other words, we had our own various forms, features, and facets of personality already. We developed into that. But we were beautiful beings back then. I'll go on and describe that sometime later, but we were beautiful beings back then, babies. Glowing with a glittering gold light, you know, from inside. Well, good God, come to think of it, that's just like what's happening right now there in the Kim Cafe. 
we're all alive with that glow. It's something like what we knew back in the way back, way back, way back. When we be wow, when we began this thing, man. The first steps into humanity when we were still really like free soaring souls, man, hearts, you know, that were just like very, very expanded into creation still, but gathering itself together in what we called the light body then, you know, like we began to take form and focus in the physicality, you know, we actually did you know, form ourselves out of mud and water and stuff and bring ourselves up out of the ocean as such. And here we are now, multiplicated into like, I think there's like 14, 16, 24, I don't know, some number like that, hanging out there. And we're not lookalikes. We're not carbon copies. I mean, we have the same form and features, but beyond that, we have characteristics, you know. Each one of us is some, you know, we, we do have a certain uniformity, though, too, you know. We're like, I suppose somebody from far away could take a look at us. You know, somebody that didn't know what was going on, take a look at us and say, oh, you all look alike. You got the same form and features. You know, I can't tell one from another. <laughs> I mean, that's assuming they don't see the spiritual energy to go with it, which does definitely characterize ourselves. You know, that's assuming they're blind as a bat. You know, <laughs> Those that could see would see some fairly uniform tall beings. I'd say about seven foot tall copper, lightly copper colored skin. You know, I mean, it's got a nice copper tone to it, you know. Uh, darker hair, you know, darker eyes, you know, elegant forms and features. I mean, you know, it makes the Romans look, you know, ugly, you know. I mean, just beautiful beings, kind of angelic looking, really. Just, but so poetically and perfectly expressed that, yeah, there is a certain uniformity between us. But we know one another by lights, colors, feelings, emotions, you know, the typical diagram of life that goes with everything and everybody. I mean, you know, it's all right there. It's the history. It's the mystery. There is no mystery in that history. It's just it's a living thing that goes with you, you know. Not something that burdens you down. It's just something there. It's how we share. It's how we characterize one another and classify one another. I guess in a way that we all live in equity there, of course. We didn't even know what equity was. We didn't have a word for it then. You know, we were just there. And we were still kind of expanded into creation as becoming a part of that creation ourselves. New experience for these godlike beings that we were, you know, a new experience. We've never tried anything like no one ever had. This was something brand new in the reality. It had never been done before, you know. Spiritual beings just didn't do this kind of shit. Now we were. And if we were successful in it, we were going to reformat all of reality, all of creation, into the, you know, after the same form and fashion. We were going to unify ourselves in a material way that the light could be more freely expressive and truly, deeply feeling and caring beyond belief. But there was a way we had to endure to bring us to such compassionate places. And that was to check everything that we were at the door and fall into a state of nothingness of unknowing and work our way back from there. And not only that, we'd have some antagonistic energy. Some of the family had gone astray or had experienced some aberrations and were ready to fight us, whatever that was, all the way through. They'd be tough little taskmasters. These were teachers of a superior nature, of a superior way, but meaner than skunks on dogs, man. I'm telling you, these guys were nasty. <laughs> and a little bit carefree, too. They didn't seem to have a whole lot of heart. So it was an interesting paradigm we were going to set ourselves down into. And this time I'm talking about now that I'm talking about the beginning where we were very similar to one another, yet very, very individual. And very, very characterized, you know, brand new times, man. We weren't quite gathered into the fully, you know, dumbed down state yet. We were in that interrogatory place. This was the place we knew we would return to. So we came there first as spiritual beings to establish, you know, uh, uh, an anchor point for ourselves, a place to return to. So we lived that life there as richly as we possibly could. Now, understand we weren't quite formatted in the way we are now. Much lighter. 
not so dense. You know, that was another change that came a little later. But this was the first time we'd formatted as human, as what we call human now, or something that was very similar to that, something that had physical substance and form to it, as well as a presence in all other realities, you know. This is before we even divided from those realities. We didn't know there was division. There was no such thing. This was the beginning of such a thing, a step in a new way, in a new direction. And we'd be really, you know, pampered for a while as we adjusted into this skin, as we called it, you know. Interesting how we come up with all these terminologies, isn't it? That's where we, where she and I were visiting these first moments, these early moments in time as the first of humanity began its journey as the light-bodied beings. The interrogatories that would mix earth and sky and bring all together just like you and I in the most elegant and gracious of forms, in the most elegant and gracious forms of manifestation in creation. Beauty such as we've never seen before. Feeling deepness such as we've never known before. We were creating that deepness by going into the darkness, by going into the dumbness. Because we knew in the depths we would find our heights. Again, that springboard effect. We knew the agony we would create in the depths would ultimately bring us out of them. And when it did, it would be rather immediate. We knew that in the beginnings. We could look forward and see the, the, the future. We could see the history as it was being created. And we could see it change in format as our inclinations change format. It's a very flexible thing. There was nothing fixed or rigid about any of it. We had our way, but we created that path by seeing it. And then we created a long old loop that brought us right back to where we were there. At that beginning point, in those light bodies, in these elegant places that were very near the ocean, yet high in the mountains. Beautiful little perches for the eagles of love. And that's what we were being called by many around us the eagles of love and of course there were pampering spirits there that came to help out there were all kinds of uh, brothers and sisters from other realms but the journey in between them was getting more and more limited it would be soon they would all be gone and we would be whatever this was alone whatever that was didn't know that feeling just yet now this queen of darkness and I had just gone back there in the moment of a hugging embrace and experienced that, understood that, saw that, saw ourselves in that same embrace in the way back when, as we departed from the elegant state, and began our descent into the unreality, the world of hell, the fires and flames of which were cold and deadly, meaner than shit. Babies couldn't believe it. But there we were, stepping forward into it. And then we experienced it in this embrace. All of that. All that we created there in that dumb and down. In that darkness. And brought it forward in a relieving groan that I'm sure shook the earth uh, for centuries. But relieved it. Let it go. In that quiet little moment of sharing there in that beautiful little cafe yeah that place is getting sexier all the time it's starting to feel like a palatial estate or something wow yet I look around and I still see rusty gold boards and yellowed old pictures and rusty old horseshoes and shiny old spurs that have seen better days and so on and so forth a worn out cafe, a dream that's hanging on for dear life, just like the tenacious grip of humanity on its life. And the assaults that are coming upon it there you now in April 20 of 2008 are incredible beyond belief. There's some real pig-headed farts still determined to play out the reality here, man, and make it tough on everybody as they do. And something's happening there in 2008 that I think is going to change that fate. 
make everything kind of great, don't you? I mean, I love happy endings. Why not spill the beans right now and get it over with? You know it's going to be a happy ending. We're going to ride off into the sunset on the spiritual horses of truth. Man, you know, and we're all going to be partying and, you know, and just have a great time. Hell, that's where it all leads up to. All we're concerned about is the story that's getting us there. Because it helped us unravel the story as we're living it now. Here in 2014, crazy as that may seem. See, time ain't this line, this long line, you know, day and night, day and night, day and night, and all the experience in it. I mean, it kind of is, but it kind of ain't. It's kind of lived uniformly. Uh, there's a uniformity to it. There's a synchronicity to it. There's a stacking of time. One on, I see it kind of as a spiral that going ever upward is about you know, a 10-12% grade, you know, kind of a graceful rise, you know. That's what I see time as. So you can be at one point on that spiral, and all the way down through that spiral, you can experience the simultaneous moment that you're living. The one that's synchronistic throughout the levels of that spiral. It's like all those levels are merged in you. And actually, all the spiral, too. You can get the whole thing all at once. That's what's called the moment of now. <laughs> Easy shit, you know, piece of cake. People have only been working on it for generations now and still ain't quite got there. Well, babies, we're there already. The stuff that our ancestors all fought and died for, we're living. We're, we're the luckiest cats to ever be alive in any universe, in any place, in any time, anywhere. Because babies... And this is what she and I there in that old Kim Cafe are realizing this old Queen of Darkness and I, this old good dude. It's kind of like we're like light and dark. We are the polarities. Yet both of us has the same energies within us. Both of us work under the same burdens and blessings. How about that? It's like we're cosmic twins or something. Just in the bed, you know, we vary greatly in the way we carry it. And how we deal with it. But you know, none of that seems to matter now. It's just all part of that thread through the weave of time, you know. We're not quite sure what does matter right now. We're a little stunned by the whole experience. It's starting to absorb into us now. And as we did this, you got to understand, all of the other five beings in that room were joined with as well six, because there's a dog. And he counts too, baby. Beautiful little black lab rescued our last party to arrive, man. Noble little saint that he is, babies. Love your animals, because they certainly love you. They might just be angels, too, you know. I've seen it, babies. I've lived with these angels for many years. I know the dogs and the horses and the heart within them. And you're beginning to see it, too, and to communicate with them. As time goes by, you'd be amazed whose mouths open and who begins to speak. Because it's already happening, babies. You're hearing it in a different way at a different level. So when the mouths come open, it's just because you're living at that level where that occurs. You see? That's really not a level. You know, we're, we're rising back into our full consciousness in levels. But as we rise through those levels, those levels dissolve away and no longer exist. There is no limitation or separation in creation. In terms of experience, we all live it together. Whatever it is, wherever it is, and however it is. Every bit of it. It's all inside of each and every one of us. See, so even though she and I symbolize some very basic energies, you know, in the beginnings of time, we're still everybody else, too. It's everyone doing through us what we're doing with everyone else, you see. That's how it works in everyone. That's why I say there is no real choosing in this reality. You know, there was a choosing up probably at some point. But you're just following an inclination and a flow of the collective in each and every little thing you do. Uh, and all the consequences of it, too. It's all a work of the collective, the collective heart. The collective flow of creation. It's a singular conscious presence. So it feels, you know, somehow we've aspected it into ourselves as this individual and personal thing. 
and it feels like it, it, it is separate. It feels like it is some kind of functional thing that bears some defending, you know, because it seems like there are assaults upon it all over the place here. <laughs> well, in 2008, we kind of knew it was coming, baby, but I tell you, this moment, I think, could dissuade it all away, don't you? I got that feeling that it could. There's something significant going on. It ain't romance, let me tell you. Far from it. Yet, whew, a closeness such as I've never experienced before with another human being. And I've experienced some really, really close times. This went beyond all description. There was an understanding. So I say it's not quite grok. We're not living in the same presence of person, in other words. We're not being one another fully and completely, but there is an understanding, a deep and complete one. We know each other, we know each other's heart very well, as if it is the same heart. Well, son of a gun, how about that? It is the same heart. Wow. We, have we ever unraveled some mystery down there at the old Kim Cafe? Baby, doesn't this give you a good start on the day? Isn't Grandpa just a little bit interesting? Kind of a fun guy to hang out with. Story after story, tale after tale. Baby, you wouldn't even know he was running my Mr. Tusk, I got a little blanket of snow out there this morning it's probably 10 degrees i haven't looked at my thermometer but judging from what i feel when i open the door i'd say it's 10 degrees out there been a little chilly through the night but maybe in here in the spaceship love we're doing just all right nine thousand feet radiating that love down upon you babies oh well yeah from nine thousand feet down upon most of us now there's a few of us that live on mountaintops and stuff Good old uh, Alana over there. And where is that? Switzerland or someplace? She lives right on top. I know. It's up there in northern Italy. She lives right on top of a mountain, man. she got a big old palatial looking thing. I'm just beautiful. Beautiful freaking place. How would you love to live on a mountain? I'd love it too, man. You know? <laughs> hey, don't you be making fun of me now. You can make fun of my dog, but you can't make fun of me, man. Every time, I gotta find that song. Every time I go to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference is if he is a hound, you better quit kicking my dog around. <laughs> I love that song, don't you? <laughs> yes, indeed we do. So let's roll on back there to the Kim Cafe for a few minutes in time here on the Coyote Medicine Show, only on the Hazy Radio Network, and see what's happening now. You know, as we're we're looking at it, you know. And that groan, that mighty release that we felt. It was kind of like a moment. Now that was a grok. That was a real moment of depth and understanding. That was a real moment of purity. And we're still kind of reeling from that. Because you got to remember now all seven hearts were here with us in that moment of realization. As we were unwinding some of the past and bringing out the truth at last. You see. In this magic moment of time in this Kim Cafe, this desolate place called Kim, Colorado, April 20, 2008, the mighty storm of April that year, I'll tell you, you're going to be there for, shoot, 82 days or longer, no, it won't be that long, but you're going to be there for 82 hours more than likely, or at least 72, baby, this is, no, this is a serious one, it's going to be a while before they plow out of this one, man. Spring storms can be like that here in the Rockies, you know. But you just have to wait and see. You just, you know, roll with it, babies. Do what you got to do. I remember one time, boy, who I got myself stuck in a snowbank there in one of these April storms just like that one. And son of a gun, I thought I was going to stay there. I just all of a sudden out of nowhere was buried in 10 feet of snow. Wasn't going nowhere even though I had four-wheel drive, etc. So I just got ready to settle down and gut it out. I knew I'd be there for a while, but son of a gun, not an hour later, somebody shows up and gives me a ride out of there. How beautiful is that? And I love Colorado. It's like that. There's some real helpful beings in this reality, you know. A lot of people have lived to tell about it just because of the graciousness of other people's hearts. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it amazing? And this is what, you know, the old Queen of Darkness and I are 
kind of looking at as we're stunnedly absorbing this experience we just had. It's like, there was this one moment where we realized, you know, the death moment, the birth moment, you know, because we were feeling these terrible agonies, you know, for all of the death and the, the pain that we'd created in this life, you know. And we, you know, we carried this burden for generations without end, you know, just feeling awful, terrible about ourselves because we'd unleashed some real negativity. There was some stunning murders and so forth, some unleashed passions back in those beginning times that just wow, the reverberations of which we're still just cleaning up the last little bit of now. It's taken us a long time to contain what we unleashed back then, and she and I in this. This kind of spirit way had held that in her heart for generation after generation, and we visited it every time we came here. And we came here a lot. We were players, man. Real players. Real, real players. Now, hang on, I gotta bring Mr. Oki back in here, cause he's out there in the cold, and uh, doesn't wanna stay there, do you, buddy? No. Since I got my bark out of me now, I'm ready to come in and get under the blanket and get warm, aren't you? You want to get under the blanket? Huh? You want to get under the blanket, buddy? Yeah. You'll get under the blanket here in a little bit. You watch, man. I just know my guy. Usually I'll hold this blanket up for him, but right now he's sitting on it, which means he doesn't trust me. I left him here while I went to the hot spring yesterday. He's watching me today. It ain't going to happen again today as far as he's concerned, man. <laughs> and that's why he's a little edgy this morning, I think, too, because I left him for a couple, three hours yesterday. He don't like being left behind at all, man. He carries on. Oh, I don't know what to do with the little guy. You know, he got a little bit of separation anxiety going on from uh, when the people that I got him from dropped him off. I mean, they just left. I mean, what could you do? And, uh, man, I guess that created a vacancy in his little doggy mind. So now, you know, because he and I are so bonded, he just like, he ain't let me out of his sight if he doesn't have to, let me tell you. And he pitches a fit. I mean, I can't even leave him in the car when somebody gives me a ride to the store. Can't hardly leave him in the car. He starts howling and carrying on. Unless somebody's there with him, then it's shut up. But otherwise, he just carrying on, going on. <laughs> Funniest thing I ever seen, man. But I do love the dog, and I don't hold it against him. You know, I know we'll work it out sooner or later. He'll get past that. You know, I just keep loving him, and he just keep loving me, and everything gonna be all right. You know. I left him for two days one time and he did all right, but he had somebody here with him then. I didn't leave him alone, you know. He had somebody here to watch over him a little bit yesterday, too, to let him in and out and stuff. But that's probably why I was pitching and fit. He'd been here alone, he probably goes gone to sleep. As long as he knows somebody's around watching on him, well, <laughs> don't you leave me alone in the house. Where's my man? Where's my man? <laughs> Where's my grandpa? I want that boy. <laughs> Did the same to me, I think, to come over at the other hot springs the other day, man. Left him out in the car, but then, then somebody parked the car the wrong way so he could see the movement over there at the hot springs. And he was pitching the fit again. He wasn't going to shut up. People were complaining, and we had to go move the truck. And <laughs> put him where he couldn't see us, so he'd shut the heck up, you know. But you got to love him for it, man. He just, he means well. He can't help himself, you know. You'd be neurotic, too, if somebody you really love just dropped you off and said goodbye. You know what I mean? It happens, but we get over it, too, don't we? Up, up, and away in our beautiful balloons, babies. Well, she and I are there looking at all the darkness that was created in some of those earlier times that basically come from our essential heart. We took it real personal, like even though we were just two of several, we took it real personal, like. And, you know, we married that burden, and carried it, you know. And now in this moment, after this embraces, we're absorbing the energy of it and the collective nature of it. We start to realize the collective nature in everything. That all is a collective, of course, but that even includes birth and death. It began to see those as the same moment. The beginning and the end joined right there in those moments you enter and leave, which are the same moment. Same beings are there present. It's like checking in and out of a machine, checking in and out of a video game. 
something along those lines is occurring. And she and I are seeing the unrealistic reality that says birth and death are the same thing. It's the same moment. It's the same experience. And in fact, it doesn't really occur at all. There is no birth. There is no death. There, there is the continuum of time and our character in it, indeed. And we've chosen to be in this little game, and you've got to understand it has that air of superficiality about it. And when you're feeling like it's kind of unreal, baby, that's what it's saying to you. You're living in a game. You're living in a movie, baby. You're playing a role. You're a player. It's a living game, man. Amazing, isn't it? Birth and death. United. One moment. One place. One movement. One experience. And all that goes on between those moments that don't exist anywhere but in one moment. See? It's an experience in dream. We never really leave our person. We are these divine beings and presences we see there at the beginning of time. Resting neath our beautiful shade tree. Dreaming a rather amazing dream. At least that's what she and I are seeing now as the energy of this moment settles, takes us away. Darlings, it's just one of those things you can't even say anything more about. It's perfect, it's poetic. So let's just leave our characters there, all seven of them. Especially those two. Let them soak it up. Who knows what, what more little bits of understanding they're going to gain now. It's amazing what happens when you gather the gods at the universe, at the center of the universe, and then begin the process of helping them become conscious of themselves again. Pretty incredible shit, wouldn't you say? Yet at the same time, just a gathering of seven little refugees in a snowstorm, a blinding snowstorm, at the Kim Cafe in Kim, Colorado. A gnarly place, just barely hanging on to the edge of life. Kind of like the rest of us two babies. Oh, wow. Grandpa Coyote spinning his tail. The tail of the Kim Cafe. Oh, yeah, baby. Right here on the Coyote Medicine Show, where... Ooh, it's a continuing story, babies. But it's on the Hazy Radio 